Wow. I'm still recovering from <laughs> the choir. Whoa, thanks, guys. Whoa. Someday I'm going to figure it out. But every time they're going this way, I'm going this way. It's a, I think it's a white thing. Anyway, I'm glad you're here tonight. And I'm going to give you two promises before we ask a couple questions and then we'll be going to prayer. Two promises. You will leave here tonight saying this is the single simplest thing I've ever heard. Amen. Promise number two, you're going to find a brand new freedom that absolutely, unconditionally, you cannot fail. Now, I'm going to ask you a question, and I'm going to look and see what the reaction is. I ask this everywhere I go. How many of you in the last year took your Bible, turned the pages of the Bible, and showed someone how they could become born again? If that's true for you, hold your hand up. If it's not, please don't. Let me just get a quick peek. That's easy. Okay, thank you, first of all, for your honesty. Probably seven or eight hands. If we were doing a little math together, would Jesus say to us, there are over 97% of us in here ashamed of the gospel that brought us our salvation? It's a tragic thing because this is what's happening in our churches today. I don't know why we're not a little worried when Jesus said, if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father in heaven. Why did he say to us, if you're ashamed of me before men, I'll be ashamed of you. Can you give me any reason that you're alive on this planet except to be his witness so before we go anywhere, we're just going to repent in prayer. Please join me. Heavenly Father, forgive us for being ashamed of the gospel that brought us our salvation. Forgive me, Father, for the times I should have shared and didn't. For anybody here, Father, who has been in the sin of silence. Father, by your power, let it end tonight that this church will be known as a lighthouse, a beacon, a place where not just the truth is preached, but unashamedly given out, regardless of what happens to us. May we be the doers of the word and not just talkers. Change our hearts tonight, Father, and always first begin with me. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. Question, how many here, and please raise your hand, have ever wanted to share your faith and chickened out? Me too. Now we're going to find out why. Fear of what? Who's going first? We're going to take them one at a time, real quick. Where I wave at me so somebody's got a mic back there and the mics are all going around so I can hear you. Where are you? Let me take you. Fear of somebody judging you. Yeah, that you're one of those guys that go to church. You're one of those that read the Bible. You're one of those that pray. You're one of those that go to church. What do we want them to think about us? <laughs> guys, we are living in an age of embarrassed Christianity. We're afraid to be one of those. Thank you for being one of those, sis. Good, some others. Fear of what? Fear of rejection. Oh, bingo. Biggest single reason Christians give for not sharing their faith, fear of rejection. Take your teaching handout and open it to the first page on the left-hand side. Everybody's got one. And ma'am, since you brought that up back there and the mic's right by you, I want you to read the definition of success. success. <coughs> Stand up and read it nice and loud. First page, left-hand side. Success. Success is acting out our Christian life, sharing the gospel and trusting God for the results. Success is not bringing someone to Christ. Read the last line again. 
Success is not bringing someone to Christ. Thank you. We've done such a terrible disservice to you in our culture, in our churches, by the words we use. I flinch every time I hear someone say, I ought to win one to Christ, because the way you hear it is that you have to cause the conversion. And if you cause the conversion, they're not saved. You see, it's Jesus that's getting rejected, Scripture that's getting rejected. I promise you, feels like you, feels like me, but it's never you, it's never me. In fact, I want to drill this point home. The lady with the glasses on her head, you go out tonight and try to tell somebody about Jesus, and they tell you, go take a hike. Have you failed? No! You go out, brother, right there, and you try to share your faith with somebody, and this becomes God's predestined chosen replacement for Billy Graham. Can you take credit for it? <coughs> no! You can't take credit for success or failure. Otherwise, you'd steal God's glory. This is the one area of your Christian life you can't fail in. If you share stupidly, unlovingly, tactlessly, and with poor timing, God will use it. But he will not use your silence. Good. Another one. Real quick, like. Having to live up to it. Huh? Having to live up to it. How do you give up things? Having to live up to it. Having to live up to it. Having to what? Having to live up to it. Oh, okay. That's a good one. In other words... You still sin. Yeah. <laughs> I have never met a non believer that expects you to be sinless, but what they rightfully should hate is the hypocrisy of when you and I pretend we don't. I'll give you an embarrassing example. I used to do some work with some of the golfers on the PGA Tour. I don't throw golf clubs. Oh, yeah. I dorked the shot, and I let the thing <laughs> fly while it's traveling. The conviction was horrible. And I said, Lord, forgive me. But you know what I had to do next? I walked up to those three non-believing men and said, would you forgive me also? If we're learning to live a life in humility, you'll draw people to the cross like a magnet. Good one, sis. Some other. A couple quick ones. Wherever you are, just call them out. Mike's? Not saying the right thing. Not saying the right thing. So in other words, sis, if you say the wrong thing, hellbound they are. But if you say the right thing, oh, man, they dive for the cross. You see what you're doing to yourself? We tend to make ourselves the Holy Spirit. We tend to make ourselves responsible. Remember the Bible verse, no one comes to Christ unless the Father does it. I got a friend, can't put a syllable together. He stuttered. But, 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 he gets away, he talks. He's introduced so many people to Christ, I've lost count. It's not with wise and persuasive words, but the Spirit's power. Give me a couple of others. Fear of. Right here. Call it out. Uh, looking stupid because you feel like you might not be able to answer all their questions. Ah, uh, not being able to answer all the questions. How long have you been a Christian? Uh, about five years. Five weeks? Yes. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Welcome aboard. Oh, that's exciting. Five oh, five years. Okay. <laughs> that's still exciting. You know, it's very rare when I do a seminar that you find somebody who says, I'm afraid I don't know enough, a brand new Christian. I thought like five weeks. Most of the time it's somebody 10, 15, 20 years. I don't know enough. The problem is he knows too much. He's spiritually constipated and needs to get rid of some of the information that he's been holding on to for so long. So what we're going to do, brother, at the end of the seminar I'm going to call you up here, and you're going to be able to share the gospel with me in 30 seconds or less, so thank you for volunteering. <laughs> Good. All right, let me pick on somebody. The guy right there in the end from Braden. Right there, you. <laughs> what? Do we have that handheld mic? Right here. I give, it, give it to him. Thank you. Hi there. Hello. I don't know if that one, is that one on? Hello, yes. That's on. All right, tell them who you are. Ramon Gregory. All right. We're going to do a little 30-second role play. 
for the moment you've lost your Christianity. You'll get it back right now, it's gone. Okay? <laughs> and I want you to become who you were before you became a Christian. <laughs> now, or you can be the worst nightmare that you think you might have to share with. Now, you just think about it. Now, here's your assignment. I want you to look for two things. What am I doing to avoid the argument? Number two, what am I not doing? What am I doing, but what am I not doing? See if you pick it up as we do this little 30-second role play. I'm just curious, sir, do you have any kind of spiritual belief? I believe there's a God. Uh-huh. What's your understanding of who Jesus is? Uh, he died for me. Huh. So you think there's heaven or hell? Yeah, pretty mm. much. I think so. So if you die, where are you going? Probably hell. Ah. Yeah. Want to do something about it if you could? I don't know if I'm ready yet. I'm too enjoying sinning too much right now. <laughs> to be honest with you. So... That's where you're going. Have a, a, have a nice trip. <laughs> Give him the mic. <laughs> now, now, who picked up what was I doing to him? What's the to him part? I'm doing what? Provoking. Provoke, how am I provoking him? By asking questions. Here's why you ask questions. Questions put you in control. When you try to tell somebody about your faith, their defense is better than your teller, and the fight's always on. Now, who picked up what I did not do? I didn't argue. You're close. I didn't, didn't tell me he's wrong. Let me make it easy for you. I never answered him. <laughs> All you got out of me was, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And you know where I learned that from? My wife. <laughs> oh, the guys understand this program, and if you don't, you will. But the principle is that if you love me, you'll listen to me. And I wasn't just listening for what he's saying, I'm listening for what he's not saying. Loneliness, fear, anger, pain, things the Holy Spirit will show you. Now, I'm going to review these questions with you before you do them. Turn one more page. The reason we're going quick tonight, you're getting a whole hour and a half seminar in much shorter time. So hang tight. All right, question number one. Do you have any kind of spiritual belief? I never ask somebody if they believe in God. You know why? None of your business. But if you ask an open-ended question, they make 10 seconds or two minutes. Illustration. I'm in California, the land of the fruit and nuts. Oh. And this lady going in a restaurant had nothing but new age occult jewelry on. And I can't resist it. I said, ma'am, why do you wear all this? She said, I'm a shaman. If you don't know what a shaman is, it's a white witch. And I said, well, do you have time for coffee? She said, yeah. So we sat down. I said, by the way, do you have any kind of spiritual belief? <laughs> by my watch, for 22 and a half minutes, all I did was go, ah, oh, mm -mm. ah. You try that for 22 minutes, especially if you're a type A personality, because you want to thump them one. Let them talk. Second question, we'll separate out religious from relational people. When you ask a religious person to you who is Jesus, they will sound like this, son of God, man that died on the cross, just what he said, God's only begotten son, theologically correct statement, but completely impersonal. Now you watch the difference. Now, my brother, you got your Christian life back, okay? If I said to you that same question, to you who is Jesus, as a Christian now, how would you answer that? Who is he to you? My personal Lord and Savior. Hear the my word? Comes out 99 out of 100 times. You know why? It's personal. It's not impersonal. 
the next question's a real easy one. Yeah, think there's heaven or hell. I had a lady in my home said, absolutely not. So I just go to the next question. See, I don't touch it. <laughs> I said, so if you died, where are you going? Oh, she said, heaven, of course. She's going to a place she doesn't even believe exists. <laughs> in the rare occasion that somebody says, I'm going to heaven, look on your handout. Only then do you say, why would God let you in? Because the answer they're going to give you will hang them later. But question five is the tough one. We didn't get to it, but if what you're believing is not true, would you want to know? Now, here's your first test tonight. What are the two possible answers? Come on. Yes? No. If it's yes, you have permission to go to part two. The only two parts, this whole thing. But I'll give you a surprising statement. I may eat it one day. Out of the thousands of times I have shared my faith, not once, not ever, never have I ever had a no that stuck. Now, I've said to someone, look, if what you're believing isn't true, do you want to know? And I've had people go, no. You know what I do? Nothing. Do what they do? Well, aren't you going to tell me? I said, nope, you don't want to know? They say, yes, I did. And here we go again. <laughs> All right, here's what I want you to do. Turn two by two. One of you becomes a non-believer, like he did. The other person, read the five questions. I'm going to walk around and eavesdrop on you. Take 30 seconds, switch roles. Go. You didn't get a handout? You didn't get a handout? Good eye contact. <laughs> Got it? Who's you, you both do it? Hmm? What brought the tears? What brought the tears? Or kids? Tears. Tears. I, I'm just happy. Huh? I'm just happy. Oh, happy tears. Okay. Just checking. Okay, round them up. First observation, do you hear the laughter as you're brutalizing each other? <laughs> now, guys with the mics, get ready. Any questions on the questions? Who's going first? Wait, grab one of the mic guys if you want to say something, let you right up here. Yes? Which number? The mic's not on. Hello? We were asking, um, number four, we both got... Ask me the question and I'll, I'll, be the, I'll answer. Oh, okay. Or let me ask it to you. Oh. Ma'am, if you fell over and died on me, where are you going? Heaven. Heaven. Oh, heaven, that's wonderful. Why is God going to let you in? Because I'm a nice person. Uh-huh. <laughs> well, ma'am, if what you're believing isn't true, would you want to know? See how powerful that last question is? 
But there's no fight because only one person is talking. Good. Anybody else? Fear? I mean, question on the questions. Number if, four, okay. If, if, um, ask me if the question. Person, oh. Okay, I'll ask it you and you respond. Okay. Um, if your fellow bird died, where are you going? I don't know. Oh, so if what you're believing isn't true, do you want to know? Yeah. I, I don't know. You don't know. Well, if you don't know, then if what you're believing isn't true, do you, do you not want to know? Maybe. Maybe. I'll tell you what I deal with maybes. The guys will appreciate this. Remember when you were dating before you were a Christian? A maybe meant yes. <laughs> Which number? Yes, ma'am. Which yes. one? Number three. Number three. Ma'am, do you think there's heaven or hell? Oh, okay. And if what you're believing is not true, would you want to know? See, at last question's a stinker. I don't want to get into a whole argument about purgatory. There's no point in it. I'm getting permission from her or any of you to go to part two. And the whole idea of the questions. Look, guys, think of this. Whoever cooks at home uses a meat thermometer. Now, why do you do that? Yeah, stick it in the fat old roast and go, excuse me, are you cooking? Now, you can't walk around in your community with a thermometer, walking up to people going, excuse me, are you cooking? But there's not a conversation you're going to have from tonight forward that you can't turn to a spiritual test point. Jesus taught us that my father is always at work. I always join my father. I do nothing on my own. So I spend my life looking around going, you over here, you over here. I want to join God where he's working. And here's a simple way I found out how to do it. There isn't a conversation I'm going to have, and I'll show you in just a second, that I can't choom, switch to a spiritual test point. What's your favorite sport? Wrestling, yeah. My goodness, and then they turned that wrestling into UFC. Those guys get their brains beat out. Some of them die. I mean, they make a ton of money. I mean, if you had a million dollars from wrestling, what would you do with it? Save it up. Save it up? Hmm? Save it oh, no. Oh. So if you die, where are you going? Well, but see, you wouldn't be a non-believer. I mean, so it's not so I can take any conversation. Let me do it from a woman's standpoint. Can't use men as an answer on this, sis. Yes. <laughs> what do you think is one of the biggest problems women face today? Besides indecision, just pick something. I would say dating, like finding a husband or a husband finding them. Doing what? A husband finding them. Finding him, yeah. I mean, somehow we think our worth is in him, but the him is human. And, you know, the average woman on a daily basis gets over a thousand advertisements a day bombed on you. You're to look like this, you're to find the right man like this, you're to you know, drive like this. I mean, you're supposed to be super mother, you're supposed to be super career. I don't know how you do it. Because God's created you with a lot of tender emotions. I mean, did you ever wonder where you go if you die? <laughs> so this week you have a simple assignment, and at the end of the evening, the pastor is going to give you an an email address, because I'm going to give you a very simple assignment. If you love the Lord, you'll do it. I want you to go to one person, just one, 
and ask these first five questions. A barber, a neighbor, a friend, an enemy. I'll give you a chicken way to do it. Just walk up to somebody and say, would you, maybe somebody you really know, and say, would you do me a favor, please? I got this assignment at church. Would you help me with my five question survey? And I want you to find out how open people are. Guys, they're not closed. I've shared my faith easily 10,000 times one on one, and I'm not kidding you. I never led anybody to Christ, but I've been around a bunch of times when the Holy Spirit's done it. Because I don't worry about causing the conversion. Success is sharing your faith, living your life for Jesus Christ, it has nothing to do with bringing anyone to the Lord. We're free from that now. Now, the whole idea of everything I do is to get to one place and one place only. But I have a suggestion. Let me see if I can find one here. Who's got a great big study Bible? Oh, we got one? Hold it up, would you, sis? That's both perfect. Just hold that up in the air. Stand up and hold it. I want people to see it. Yeah, just stand up. I got a suggestion for you. Don't carry Big Boomer. <laughs> Thank you. If you're going to become pagan sensitive, put Boomer away. Before I was ever a Christian, when somebody like you dared to try to take me to lunch, I got enough trouble just being you with you, let alone you with an it. So I have a suggestion. This is the Share Jesus Without Fear New Testament. Doesn't look like a Bible, looks like a checkbook, it looks like a day timer. But what it is, is my commitment to God that where I go, he goes. Now, I don't care how you examine this book, historically, archaeologically, I don't care how you do it. If they ever find an error anywhere in the manuscripts, your faith is in vain. To be at Impact Church is to total stupidity. But since no one has and no one will ever find an error in this Bible, then we believe every cross, T, and dotted I in it. In fact, if you need an easy million dollars, just go to the New York Bible Society and show them one error anywhere in the manuscripts, they'll write you a check. People all the time say, well, there's errors in the Bible. I go, oh, really? Would you mind showing me one, please? And they go, well, I, uh, I, uh, I said, I couldn't find one either. Let's turn to Romans 3.23. <laughs> this isn't a big fight. Remember, there's only two motives for evangelism. Love of God, love of people. Any other motive, you're going to find your flesh. Now, I'm about to teach you a way that you can use your sharing Bible and nobody, the worst you've ever met, nobody can argue with you. And it's going to work off two biblical principles. Turn one more page in your teaching handout, please. To where it says suggested, or no, part two, I'm sorry, part two. Part two. Or the reverse. Now, look up here. I'm going to give you two biblical principles that nobody can argue with you if you use them. Principle one comes out of Romans 10, 17, which says, faith comes from hearing. Almost sounded like a Lutheran church. One more time. <laughs> faith comes from hearing. There we go. I want you to please remember the word hearing. Just store it. Second principle I don't expect you to know comes out of Luke 10, 26. Jesus sees a guy reading the law. Jesus walks up to this guy and says, hey, what does it say to you? Now, how do we put these two biblical principles together using the Bible and nobody can argue with you? Give him the mic if you would. I'm going to take my little sharing Bible. And I'm going to turn it to Romans 3.23, which I thought I already had it marked, but obviously I didn't. Now, the only verse I've got marked in bright yellow is the one I want him to read. But I'm going to want to find out who's been really listening. 
Who can raise their hand and tell me how I'm going to have him read it? Raise your hand. Oh, I got two of them up here. Out loud, because what faith comes from? Hearing. And there's a practical reason. He might be reading the wrong verse. You'll never know if you're reading the quiet. Watch how simple this is. Sir, down there in the bottom right is Romans 3, 23. Would you read that for me out loud? Bottom right. For all have sin. The mic's not on. For all, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory. Last word. Okay. Of God. Uh, oh, yeah, glory of God. Now, what does that say to you? Everybody has sinned. You know what I'm going to do? Turn the page. You know why we're not fighting? Because I don't open my mouth. Here's the key. Before, you always said to the person, this is what it says, and the fight's on. But when he just read this, understood it only by the power of the Holy Spirit, remember, the man without the Spirit doesn't understand the things that come from the Spirit. They're foolish. So this became his truth, not my truth, shoved on him. Did you catch that? Because that's key. Read it out loud. What's it say to you? Read it out loud. What's it say to you? Now, all of you open your Bibles to Romans 3.23. Going to do a couple things at once. Romans 3.23. And while you're doing that, please take your hand out and turn one more page where it says, Suggested Scriptures. So we're getting our Bibles open to Romans 3.23. We're turning where it says suggested scriptures. And there's at least 10 people in here who are saying to themselves right now, I'm never going to remember all these verses. No problem. I'm about to give you the neatest little cheat sheet you ever had. And it's okay, it's a Christian one. Now, look up here. So everybody look up here, because I'm going to show you a neat little trick. Everybody take your Bible and turn it towards me, flat, like you were going to have me read it. Just turn it towards me. Good. Got it? Turn it towards me. Now, take your Bible, pull it towards your tum-tum. You got two white margins. Good. Touching your tum-tum. Take your finger, put it on the page where the verse is. You got a 50-50 chance. Pull it all the way up to your tum-tum. Now you're on a white margin right next to your tummy. And right there, I want you to write Romans 6.23. First hand up, why? Next verse. If you can remember one verse, you're going to have a rabbit trail all through the Bible. They'll be convinced you've been to seminary. <laughs> Let me just repeat it one more time because I always know somebody misses it. Look, your Bible's open to Romans 3.23. Just pull it next to your chest. Put your finger on the page where the verse is. Pull it all the way up to your tummy. And right there in the white margin facing you, it says Romans 6.23. So while he's reading Romans 3.23, it says to me, okay, dummy, this is where you're going next. <laughs> That's it. Now, I'm not going to walk you through all the verses because of the sake of time. But I want to tell you how powerful the Word of God is. A lot of ways you can share your faith. And I didn't fib you when I said I've shared my faith well over 10,000 times. There's a totally radically different dynamic using the Bible than any other way you can share your faith. I was asked to uh, meet a young girl that had murdered her mom and her dad. She was uh, 16. 
in the Denver County Jail. When I asked her those first five questions that you're going to do with somebody this week, and hopefully the rest of your life, she knew nothing about God, nothing about Jesus, nothing about anything. But she gave me permission to open my Bible. This is what I'm living for. We got to just the second verse, and I had her read it how? Good job, guys. And she did. The wages of sin is death, the gift of God's eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And I said, what does that say to you? Her answer, I've never forgotten. She said, I need to ask God to forgive me for all of my sins and invite Jesus Christ into my life. Does that verse say that? No way, not on your best day. Where did she get the answer for her salvation from? The Holy Spirit. You know what I didn't do? I didn't say, hold it, young lady, I got five more verses to go. <laughs> Folks, if God wants to do this in one verse or 100, that's his business. Amen. My job, read it out loud. What's it say to you? Read it out loud. What's it say to you? Now, what happens if they don't understand a verse? How do you avoid the fight? Look below your suggested scriptures. Three words in big letters. What do they say? Read it again. So if somebody misunderstands or doesn't understand a verse, don't fight them. Don't play teacher. Just very kindly say, would you mind reading that again? Let the Holy Spirit do what he does so perfectly. Now. We come to the part Christians fear the most. How in the world do you ask somebody for a decision? You remember our brother over there that was afraid he didn't know enough. So come on up. You get a mic. Bring your hand out. Prayer didn't work, did it? <laughs> Tell them who you are while you're walking. My name is Pastor Brandon Johnson. I'm the assistant youth pastor here at Impact Church. Uh, well, no, not a speech. I know who you are. All right. I'm going to put you in a story okay. that actually happened to me. Okay. Now, remember, he was a guy that didn't think he knew enough, right? Remember? Okay. This actually happened, and I'm driving from my church, coming home on a Wednesday night, winding road. All of a sudden, six or eight squad cars, dome lights going. Terrible accident. Volkswagen crushed against a tree. Jaws for life were laying on the ground. You look over and you see a bunch of hubbub around a stretcher where they're sticking needles and IVs in this kid's arm. This 19-year-old boy is dying. You look over, the flight for life is over there. And the Holy Spirit says, go. So you push your way through the crowd kneel down by the young man, and you realize now you face two practical problems. Problem one, he can't speak. All he can do is go, huh, in agreement with you. Problem two, you got less than 30 seconds, and I call this the final five. Go for it. Son, are you a sinner? Huh. Do you want forgiveness of sins? Huh. Do you believe Jesus Christ died on the cross for you and rose again? Uh. Are you willing to surrender your life to Jesus Christ? Huh. Are you ready to invite Jesus Christ into your life and into your heart? Uh. The next day, he was dead. And I know one biblical fact. If his uh was from his heart, he is a young man walking the streets of gold going, whoo, Amen. this was close. Amen. Thank you. Give him like. Remember why I picked on him? Just because he jokingly said he didn't know enough. But how come he just shared the gospel with me in 17 seconds? If this gospel is simple enough for a child to understand it, what excuse is there for an adult not to share it? That story didn't end until several years later. And I'm doing a seminar like this. And a godly old grandma came flying up out of the back row and said, was it a green Volkswagen? I said, how'd you know? She said, that was my grandson. 
Every time I think and tell that story, I think about how awesome is our God. With seconds to go in someone's life, he's willing to send any one of us who understand the simplicity and the power of this gospel. Now look at question number one. Are you a sinner? All I want you to notice, remember the first verse of scripture he read? All have sinned. So the scriptures are preparing the heart for the final five questions. Now drop down to question five. I read about Christ in your life and in your heart. Now, there are two words on the bottom of that page in a box. One says silence, the other says pray. If I had permission from my wife, which she won't give me, I'd like to change the word silence to shut up. <laughs> it's a nasty word, but it makes the point. Folks, whenever you ask someone if they're ready to surrender your, their life to Christ, please shut up. 10 seconds of silence to them feels like 10 minutes. The Holy Spirit's working on them. The Word of God is working on them. Angels in heaven are working on them. I've seen people break out in sweat, but they're not fighting with me and they're not fighting with you because you don't have to win. You're a witness that presents the truth. You can't convince anybody. You couldn't convince yourself. That's the Holy Spirit's job, period. Now, question. When you ask someone, are you ready to invite Christ to your life? What are the two possible answers? Come on. Yes, no. If it's yes, fine, I'll pray a sinner's prayer. But how do we deal with no? Last thing I want to teach you. So, Mike's, get ready. Raise your hand and let's give me some objections you think you'll hear to the question, are you ready to invite Christ to your life and in your heart? Who's going first? Stand up so they can find you. Okay. Talk at the mic. I can't hear you. Do we have... Make sure the mics are on, guys. Um, can you hear me? Hmm? Mics are not on, guys. <laughs> um, um, I, was gonna ask I can't hear you. Dang. Okay, you're, are you ready to invite Christ to your life? G give me an objection. Um, yes, I'm scared to go. I'm scared. Oh. Now we're good. There's a little word under there. Starts with a W, H in the middle, and a Y. Yeah. See, I don't have a clue why she's scared. Nobody knows why she's scared except God. So I'm going to say, Ma'am, why are you scared? It's called the Y principle. That I won't get accepted. That's that you, you're afraid because you're guilty. I know. <laughs> so am I. But you see, and I'm going to go to the, the Bible verse. It says there is no more guilt or condemnation. For those in Christ, I'm going to let her read the verse. How? God. Let God convince her that he'll take care of her guilt. Not me. Good. Some others. Some others. You ready to invite Christ to your life in your heart? Yes, ma'am. I would, but I'm a Jehovah Witness. She would, but what? Oh, J.W., you're a Jehovah Witness. <laughs> well, ma'am, I think that's exciting. Um, you guys really work hard at uh, trying to earn your salvation, don't you? I've often wondered, how many doors does the Bible say you have to knock on before you get forgiven? It doesn't, does it? Um, how many good deeds does the Bible say you have to do before you get saved? It doesn't. So, you know, I have a verse here that always troubled me, and maybe you can help me with it. And I would go over to John 8 where it says, if you do not believe who I say I am, you'll die in your sins. And that's Jesus. So he's not an archangel. He's Satan, Lucifer's brother is what he is. And so ma'am, as a JW, I'm going to that verse and sure, it is not by works, but by grace you're saved through your faith. It's such a horrible religion. You can work yourself to death and maybe never make the Jehanadab class of the magic 144,000. It's tragic. Good. 
Some other. Over there. Are you ready to invite Christ to your life? What's your objection? How do I know if God is, how do I know if what you're telling me is not fake? How does he know what? How do I know if what you're telling me is not fake? Well, sir, first of all, if you think about it, I haven't told you anything. <laughs> no, this, is, this comes up a lot. In fact, sir, everything that you've read is from the Word of God. Everything that you've learned has been by the power of the Holy Spirit. And since God can't lie and no one's ever found an error in the Bible, if I were you, I'd believe him. I wouldn't believe me, but I'd believe every word that's in this book. Good one. Some others. Fear of? A couple no, more. No, no, no. No. Right here. No. Mike, no. I'm not ready here when I get ready. Oh, I'm not ready. Anybody here know why he's not ready? No, you don't. Think about shrinks. Shrinks know nothing. Shrinks go around and go, why do you feel this way? <laughs> you pay them $100 an hour to say that to you, and they're trying to get you to burp something up. So the why thing is really a great technique. Sir, why are you not ready? I'm not through having fun. Oh, my party guy. Oh, OK. Yeah. Here's how I deal with my party guy. I get a lot of this. Well, sir, first of all, thank you for your honesty. So I take it, you know, you're kind of out with that wild lady, a little sex, drugs, rock and roll on the weekend. Got it right here. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I just have one last question. Let's suppose since tonight you've rejected Jesus. And you're out there whipping down I-95, and all of a sudden, kapow, you're part of the cement. According to what you've read, go back to here, it's my authority. According to what you've read and died, where did the Bible say you'd go? Straight to hell. Have a nice evening, sir. <laughs> they will drive carefully for at least 48 hours. <laughs> it is a good thing when somebody knows they're going to hell. I'm in a church not long ago, and this lady walked in in the morning service, and I knew as much as I knew my own name, she wasn't saved. Just a Holy Spirit thing. And after the service, I'd forgot, forgotten about her, preached, and talking to people, I turned around, whoa, she's right there. I said, step back, I said, hello. She goes, hello. Ooh. I said, do you go to this church? No. I, she said, I'm visiting with my son. Well, the son had come forward to visit with people, and she had to come along. So I said, what would you think of the message? She says, nothing. <laughs> I said, well, if you die, where are you going? She says, hell. I said, that's exciting. <laughs> I said, there's some people in this church, ma'am, are going to be right with you. <laughs> and I said, pastor, come here a minute. I want you to meet a lady going to hell. And she looked at me, she said, you're crazy. I said, no, I'm not the one ma'am going to hell. And she, I'll never forget when she knelt with her son at the altar. Good, let me switch. Look guys, the most you're gonna remember in this very encapsulated version is about 10%. In the bookstore is an hour and a half CD. They used to be about 10 bucks, but because of my love of impact, these are now five. Yeah. So it, you need to listen to this. It'll cover stuff I didn't, reinforce stuff I did. Always the most popular item in the bookstore is this New Testament. But why is this different? All of the content that I've been teaching you is in the first two pages, and in the back are the 36 most common objections, like we've been doing here, and how to answer them, all right back here. This will fit in your pocket, your wallet, your purse, but you know what this is? It's a commitment. I've said to people, you ever catch me without this anywhere? Restaurant, dinner, ball game, I'll buy anybody lunch. This is like my wallet, it goes where I go. For those of you who process by reading, this is the whole enchilada. This covers the story of my life, 
which I don't have time to share tonight, but I'll give you one sentence of teaser and give you some encouragement that if God can reach me, there isn't anyone in your life who he can't reach. Because in 1980, I owned the largest house of prostitution in the United States. I'm involved in racketeering, bookmaking, gambling. I'm president and chief executive officer of a multi-million dollar international company. I had everything the world told me, if you get it, you'd be fine. Well, the world lied to me, because I had it all, and I wasn't fine. Two arrests, a $250,000 bond, and March 4th, 1981, through you'll see the circumstances in the book, I had the privilege to surrender my life at 10 o'clock in the morning to Jesus Christ, and he took my life, and he flipped it. I didn't flip it. He flipped it. This covers everything plus more, 199 pages, and I think these are $11. Maybe they're 10. I, you have to check with the bookstore. We got just a couple minutes left. I get around in every denomination, every culture you could imagine all over the world. And sometimes it's very easy to recognize faults and stuff in churches because you see it. It's the outsider coming in. It's easy to spot. But I'll give you an observation. There is, a, and I don't say anything if I don't mean it, there is a huge amount of genuine love in this sanctuary. And for you people to keep this silent, it is sin. Not just do you show me love, but if you can take that outside this building, it's the single most powerful weapon we have in evangelism. My wife goes crazy all the time. She said, you get to be so invasive into people's lives. They tell you anything because I care. Somebody is not just an object that I want to spit words at. I care. I know. I don't care whether it's the proverbial perfect-looking woman or the rich guy with all the diamonds. I know he's empty. Been there, done it. I don't care what his persona is, what his outside looks like. I know he's empty. And I love him enough to tell him about Jesus Christ. 50% that attend an evangelical church on a Sunday, folks, they're not born again. They're religious. They put money in the plate, maybe made some moral adjustments. But the litmus test is one thing. Are you really? born again by God's definition? Or are you like Matthew 7, 21, where Jesus said, many of us on the day of judgment will say to me, Lord, Lord, I did this nice religious stuff, never missed a Wednesday or Sunday. Remember the words that follow? Get away from me, I don't know you. If anything, you need to ask God in just a moment, because you can't give away what you don't have. Am I, God, by your definition, really born again? Have I really completed what I say is my salvation by demonstrating it through a baptismal tank? Or if I'm, if I'm so ashamed I can't get in some water in front of brothers and sisters, then something's wrong with this program. The water won't save you. My father already did that. But everywhere you go, don't have unsaved people in your life? How many unsaved relatives you got? Make a list. How many unsaved neighbors? Where you take your recreation? Where you work? Sit with me and you'll have 50, 60 names on a piece of paper. They ought to be on a prayer list begging. My daughter was on a prayer list for 40 years before I watched her baptism three weeks ago. 
I didn't do anything. He did it all. We get to be the privilege in the process. So let's just take a moment and bow our heads. Some of you who are truly not sure about your salvation, you might just enjoy praying this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, you are truly an awesome God, the one true living God. Father, I've got so many sins in my life, I don't even know where to begin. And Lord Jesus, if I've been faking it, hoping to make it, if I've been a pretender, let it end tonight. Father, I want to surrender all right now to you. I know, Father, it's not this prayer, but it's my heart you're listening to. And I want to become a bond servant to you, Lord. No more half-stepping. And I'm going to prove it by unashamedly sharing my faith with anybody who will listen. Father, thank you for the privilege this week because I'm going to call and send an email to this church saying, I've shared my faith. Forget results. Those belong to God. We want to hear from you because, Lord, we've heard from you. You've given us our marching orders. Let this church be what it's called to be. Thank you for the people in it that have been so loving and responsive. In Jesus' name, I pray. Pastor? Uh, if you pray that prayer, 